So when you summarize a passage, read it quickly and restate the main points. Utilitarianism is one of the most powerful and persuasive approaches to normative ethics in the history of philosophy. Normative means something that sets standards, what is right, what is wrong, what is good. Uh, and this is one of the most powerful and persuasive approaches. Though not fully articulated until the 19th century, proto-utilitarian positions can be discerned throughout history, throughout the history of ethical theory. This started in the 19th century, but the proto-utilitarian, the first of the utilitarian approaches were there in ethical theory itself. Though there are many varieties of the view discussed, utilitarianism is generally held to be the view that the morally right action is the action that produces the most good. This is the general theory of utilitarianism, that the morally right action is the action that produces the most maximum good. There are many ways to spell out this general claim. That is the most important line of that paragraph. One thing to note is that the theory is a form of consequentialism. The right of action is understood entirely in terms of consequences. So when do you say some act an action is correct? On the basis of its consequences. And what distinguishes utilitarianism from egoism has to do with the scope of the relevant consequences. When you talk of utilitarianism, it means do uh, action. It talks of right action. And what is right action? Action that produces the maximum good. How do you know what is the right action? In terms of the consequence, the amount of good that it creates. And therefore, utilitarianism is slightly different from egoism. In what way? The scope of the relevant, cons the, the, the scope, the range of the relevant consequences. On the utilitarian view, one ought to maximize the overall good, that is, consider the good of others as well as one's own good. This is the basics. This is the understanding of, gives you an idea what is utilitarianism. Now we go on to the utilitarians, people who propagated this theory. The classical utilitarians, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, identified the good with pleasure. And so with Epicurus were hedonists. So Bentham and Mill said, good means ones that gives pleasure. So in some ways, they were like the Epicureans. Uh, they were like Epicurus, they were hedonists. A hedonist is one who believes that the purpose of life is the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, about value. They also held that we ought to maximize the good, bring about the greatest amount of good for the greatest number. This is what Bentham and Mill said, greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. Utilitarianism is also distinguished by impartiality and agent neutrality. So when he uses terms like this, when any passage uses terms like this, the explanation of that term will be immediately after it. Sometimes it comes before it with the term summing it up. Here it comes after it. So what are those two terms that we need to see? Impartiality and agent neutrality. What is that? Everyone's happiness counts the same. When one maximizes the good, it is the good impartially considered. Clear? What does impartiality and neutrality mean? Everyone is the same and when you are talking of maximizing the good, you are talking of, you are impartially talking about the good. My good does not, counts for no more than anyone else's good. Further, the reason I have to promote the overall good is the same reason anyone else has to promote the good. It is not peculiar to me. Though the first systematic account of utilitarianism was developed by Jeremy Bentham, the core insight motivating the theory occurred much later. So the first concepts of utilitarianism, the father of utilitarianism is Jeremy Bentham. But these concepts had already been expressed much, much earlier. That insight is that what, what, is, what was expressed earlier the morally appropriate behavior will not harm others and increase happiness or utility. What is morally appropriate behavior? Something that doesn't harm others, something that increases happiness or utility. 
what is distinctive about utilitarianism in its approach is taking that insight and developing an account of moral evaluation and moral direction that expands on it. This was earlier there in moral theory, that morally appropriate behavior is something that doesn't harm others, something that increases uh, the pleasure of everyone. But what did utilitarianism do? It took it further, right? It developed it further by developing an account of moral evaluation and the moral direction that this morally appropriate behavior ought to take. Clear? Some of the earliest utilitarian thinkers, so we've, we've, he talked about Jeremy Bentham and how Jeremy Bentham borrowed or, or developed the uh, ethical theories on what is morally appropriate behavior. Now we are coming to some other parts. Some of the earliest utilitarian thinkers were the theological utilitarians such as Richard, Cumber Richard Cumberland and John Gray. They believed that promoting human happiness was incumbent on us since it was approved by God. Human beings have to promote happiness. Why? Because God asked it. God approved it. After enumerating the ways in which humans come under obligations, the obligation to be virtuous, uh, the uh, civil obligations, obligations arising from authority to God, so human beings come under various obligations. We, we by by uh, very being human, we have certain duties and obligations. And he spelt out the different obligations, obligation to nature, to be virtuous, civil obligations, etc. Then he quotes John Gay. The passage quotes John Gay. From the considerations of these four sorts of obligations, it is evident that a full and complete obligation which will extend to all cases can only be that arising from the authority of God. We have different kinds of obligations, four different kinds that have been enumerated in the passage. All these arise from the authority of God. God is the one who created these obligations for people. Because of God only can in all these cases make a man happy and miserable. Therefore, since we are obliged to that conformity called virtue, it is evident that the immediate rule or criterion of it is the will of God. Why should we be good? Why should we be virtuous? Because we have an obligation to be good and virtuous. And why is that? Because that is the will of God. That is what God wants us to do. That is what uh, John Gay says. All right, now this is the uh, penultimate, uh, this is the last concluding paragraph of the passage. Promoting human happiness and one's own coincided, but given, so human happiness and one's individual happiness coincided. They are one and the same. But given God's design, it was not an accidental coincidence. The fact that everyone's happiness is your happiness is willed by God. It didn't happen by accident. This approach to utilitarianism, the theos, theological utilitarianism, the one that said, the one earlier to Bentham uh, and Mill, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, promoted by Cumberland and John Gay, this approach to utilitarianism is not theoretically clean. This is the author's opinion in the sense that it isn't clear what essential work God does, at least in terms of normative effects. God, as the source of normativity, is compatible with utilitarianism, but utilitarianism doesn't require it. So this theory about God's will, human happiness and universal human happiness coinciding is not very clear. We don't know what is God's role in it and uh, God's in terms of normative values. Normative, I told you, means uh, evaluative values, the values that set the standard of what is right, what should be good, what is desirable. Right? So he says it's not clear. Therefore, this entire theory is not theoretically clean. Understood? So we started, he started by talking to us about what is utilitarianism, how it is, it has its basis in moral and ethical theory. Jeremy Bentham was the first person who uh, gave uh, the utilitarian theory, but he also borrowed, uh, he only developed the main concepts given in the ethical theory. Then he talks about the second type of utilitarians, uh, the early, which is even earlier to Bentham, and they are the theosophical utilitarians who said 
दैट वी प्रमोट ह्यूमन हैप्पीनेस बिकॉज इट्स द विल ऑफ गॉड तो अर्थ सेज दिस सेकेंड थियोरी गिवन बाई कम्बरलैंड एंड जॉन गे एंड ही कोट्स दैम इज नॉट वेरी क्लीन इट डजेंट रियली क्लैरिफाई वॉट इज द रोल ऑफ गॉड एंड इन टर्म्स ऑफ नॉमेटिव एथिक्स क्लियर दैट्स द समरी ऑफ द पैसेज विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज द मोस्ट कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ impartiality and agent neutrality given in the passage whenever you are asked a definition or description of terms used in the passage it's always a good idea to refer back to the sentence in the passage where this is used often if it's a difficult term or a slightly ambiguous term the author gives its definition either the beginning of uh, either before the using the term or after it generally after it let's go to the relevant section of the passage and see utilitarianism is also distinguished by impartiality and agent neutrality what does this mean the next paragraph will tell me everyone's happiness counts the same when one maximizes the good it is the good impartially considered okay everyone's happiness is the same and when you maximize your good it is impartially considered concept of good that is what is meant by impartiality and agent neutrality agent neutrality how does it happen comes after that my good counts for no more than anyone else's good therefore the reason i have to promote the overall good is the same reason anyone else has to promote the good so then as an agent promoting good you are neutral because your happiness and someone else's happiness is the same so impartiality everyone's good is the same second when you promote your own good you're promoting everyone's good you can't promote your own good exclusive of others that is called agent neutrality understood let's look at the option which explains this exactly as it is everyone's happiness and good carries the same weight and everyone's motive to promote the good is the same perfect everyone's happiness has the same weight it's the same first line of that passage second everyone's motive to promote the good is the same because you're promoting your good you're promoting someone else's good you can't do that uh, you can't separate the two so a is a very good answer still we should look at b c and d happiness does not discriminate it's not happiness doesn't discriminate you don't discriminate while promoting happiness so this has misrepresented the uh, meaning of agent neutrality and impartiality one should not discriminate on the basis of how, how happy one is and should work on the basis of common good it doesn't talk about the basis of discrimination everyone is equally entitled to happiness and nobody can deny happiness to anyone everyone is equally entitled to happiness is correct but everyone's happiness has the same value that is the important part and when we talk of good this concept of good is impartial it's not like good which is good for a not good for b therefore this also doesn't represent the exact meaning therefore my correct answer is a